<laughs> Cesara, thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, so I hope uh, nobody objects to our recording because we do record record our sessions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Staira, <laughs> for initiating the recording. So we, so we, um, yeah, so we, the Saturday sessions are um, mainly to initiate a conversation around African liberation, unification, and development. And obviously, the question of Haiti um, is part of, as we see it, part of our African liberation, unification, development, because the African Caribbean is part of our region of Africa. Uh, so um, the history of Haiti, the present uh, of the, the present of Haiti, and the future of Haiti is of uh, enormous importance to us. So uh, today we chose to uh, focus on the, the the history of Haiti, and it came up because last week we discussed the sheer wickedness and vindictiveness of France as a colonial power when it was asked by French Africa to leave the continent. They were so vindictive, for example, that they destroyed all infrastructure and they claimed that there was something called the benefits of colonialism. And so they got the French African elite, apart from Guinea, uh, to sign the pact for the continuation of colonialism. So it was as part of that discussion that Haiti kept popping up. So then Brasati also was here. So, so, so we decided that why don't we have a, a session on, 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 on Haiti, um, which, is, which is why we are doing that. And as I said, we are happy to have more sessions on, 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 on Haiti. Uh, but in terms of the, the, the current situation, it was, the, it was also the invitation by, by, um, by the the Prime Minister of Haiti to the President of Kenya, President Ruto, <laughs> to send a thousand strong, I believe, a thousand strong policemen into to Haiti to help keep the gangs, <laughs> to help control the gangs. And when he returned, he couldn't land his his plane, and he had to resign. Um, so, so that also clearly for us was an indication that uh, Haiti does recognize its its partnership. With, with Africa. So, so I mean, some of us would argue that the, the, the future of Haiti is in the African Union as a continental uh, organization and as part of the region of Africa. Um, so thank you. So we'll be hearing from uh, Brother uh, Satish on the Haitian Revolution. And um, so we'll hear from him for, Brother Satish, how long will you speak for? I'm not absolutely sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, what I thought I'd do is try to uh, talk about the Haitian Revolution itself, then yes. take some well, questions. Well, how, how long will you, will you need that for? Uh, let's say half an hour, maybe. I'm not okay. sure. Excellent. Okay. That's fine. So after <laughs> half an hour, Arabada Satish's uh, presentation, um, he will do an, a, a question and answer session, and then we'll open the floor to other contributors. Uh, as is the tradition with our Saturdays, we'll hear the news uh, across the continent. Um, what we are not getting is uh, the new situation from, from, from the regions outside the continent. And in terms of what is happening to our brothers and sisters of the continent. So the newspaper that we, we normally share is the continent which is published in South Africa. Uh, we shall welcome anyone here who thinks there is a newspaper that summarizes the African situation <clears throat> globally to share it with us so we can also review it. Uh, the reason we review the news is because on Saturdays we have a session on the philosophy and the ideology of Pan-Africanism as championed by the African freedom fighters led by Osaji for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah of the Gold Coast, which became Ghana. And that tradition of fighting for the liberation of Africa, starting with the Gold Coast in 1957, uh, was then brought together uh, and summarized into a book called Consciencism. And that book is a legacy 
philosophical and ideolo ideological legacy for us, today's Pan-Africanists. And if we want to move the continent forward, then we have to imbibe, understand where we have come from and where we are going philosophically and ideologically. Western liberalism is not going to save us. Western conservatism is not going to save us. Western social constructivism is not going to save us. It has to be a progressiveness that is rooted in the African perspective. And that is provided by conscientism. So we discussed that on, on, on Thursdays, every Thursday. We've been doing this for, for 10 years now, both online and offline. We started, we started offline and then we went online when the pandemic broke. And that we, we do on, on, on Thursdays, again, from seven to nine. Now on Saturday, we then hear the news as an application of our thinking. So the purpose of the news is to enable us think of the African situation in philosophical and ideological terms. There is nothing higher in terms of war when it comes to the state of your mind. Philosophical and ideological warfare is the highest form of warfare as far as we are concerned. If you can protect your mind from infiltration by the enemy in quote, quote unquote, then you are in a position to fight the right war. So um, we, will, um, we will hear the news um, <clears throat> and then um, I'll share the paper online so you can see. And then after that, we shall then ask anyone here to share news from wherever they are, we'll make it very brief, and and then and then from there, we shall then um, go into the presentation by Brother Satish, the question and answer session, and then and then open the floor. Um, so here we go. Here is um, the the uh, <clears throat> the publication that we look at. I have highlighted sections, so I'm not going to be reading the entire magazine as it were. Uh, so this is called The Continent, it's African Journalism. And in this news, they focus on uh, some key stories. The first one is Egypt and the fact that the EU has given 7.4 billion uh, in a deal um, to, to Egypt so that Egypt will stop the Africans from crossing the Mediterranean into Europe. <clears throat> you recall that they helped Tunisia as well. They gave Tunisia also about 1.3 billion to help <clears throat> their budget. And that included 1.60 million for cabin <clears throat> migration. Please, um, in looking at this news, your mind must be on the forces, um, both positive and negative, that are battling the continent. That's what you should be thinking of. Then the other uh, news mm -hmm. is South Africa. Uh, apparently, uh, the uh, Speaker of the National Assembly has been grounded <clears throat> because of bribes of uh, forming on rand. Um, in Ethiopia, citizens were stealing money from uh, ATMs because there was a glitch in the uh, co commercial bank's system and, um, and so on. In, <clears throat> um, uh, in Niger, the government has revo revoked a 12-year counterterrorism or co cooperation agreement between the two countries. And uh, in, in, in India, it is said that India has now been able to end extreme poverty. Uh, I'm not sure we Africa have done that yet. Uh, Sudan has, in Sudan, uh, the, the previous uh, uh, president, Al-Bashir, has been moved to a, a safe military site because um, he, apparently his life was threatened because his former protector, Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, who leads the rapid support forces that he himself helped to set up, by the way, um, basically besieged the, the, the city he was in. So they had to move him. <clears throat> the, the, um, the opposition leader in Central African Republic uh, has been arrested, even though he had documentation showing that what he said was true, <laughs> that the that the, the four magistrates and the justice ministers were corrupt, even though he had documents, he had been arrested and asked to pay a fine. Uh, Museveni in Uganda has made his son the head of the army. Um, it turns out that um, um, 
the countries in in Africa uh, have been uh, selling baby baby food formula uh, formula for baby food which is promoted by 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 US companies and even though the food is not as good as uh, breast milk um so the uh, the, the, the World Health Organization asks that women breastfeed their children for two years um, because uh, when a child is born in the first a few days, the child gets from the breast everything it needs. The child needs uh, to fight all kinds of, of, of things that the child will suffer. And then the child also gets all it needs from the breast milk. But um, the, the co companies have waged war on women uh, in that sense, uh, uh, so that they don't breastfeed their children. And so there's a, there's a story on that. Um, uh, in Nigeria, there's a pres presidential election coming up. Uh, in Ghana, because of the underground cable uh, network problems, you know, I don't know if you heard that um, internet was shut down uh, uh, partially or to a large extent in different uh, African countries and uh, including South Africa. And that's because the cables were under the ocean and something happened. So um, Elon Musk company, Starlink, has been uh, approached by Ghana um, to be part of its, its orbit type internet so that it relies more on the internet, which relies on, on space, on space rather than under the ocean. Um, um, Egypt has increased price, the price of uh, fuel. It used to be three, three pence a dollar for a liter. Now they've increased it because they approached the IMF for money. And the IMF is saying, well, if we're going to give you money, then you have to um, do this and that and that. And uh, we know the IMF is notorious for telling uh, other uh, countries what to do um, because it is a he hegemonic power of the US. Uh, in, in Togo, in Nansingbe, uh, Yadema San Fore has changed the constitution to enable him to um, be president uh, without being elected. And so that story is here. Uh, it's not the only one. You will know other African uh, uh, presidents uh, change the constitution so they can stay in power forever and ever. Um, then there's something on on this gentleman uh, called called um, Isemi. Apparently, uh, he won he won the Africa All Africa Games in Accra uh, this this week, I believe, and uh, he ran 9.96 uh, seconds. But you know, you say Bolt's record of 9.58. I don't think that has been beaten. Um, but anyway, apparently. He, he he's 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 a hope. He's basically a Cameroonian hope for some kind of medal. Uh, the DRC uh, jailed a a, a um, journalist uh, called uh, Stanis. Don't you get his name? Stanis uh, Bujakira, and he's now been released through the efforts of all kinds of forces. And um, apparently, um, he published something that he said wasn't true. Um, so they jailed him. But that's not the first time journalists have been jailed in any country. You know, um, all countries uh, at some point uh, do not like journalists who expose the truth. Um, in terms of the Ramadan in Egypt, prices have gone up. So people are suffering. Uh, in terms of to, how to get the right nutrients when they break their fast. Um, an accountant in, in Egypt is earning 3,000 um, uh, Egyptian uh, pounds, which is uh, which I checked is about 51 pounds sterling. Just imagine a month. Uh, that, that's very low. And they're having currency devaluation. But in short, um, the Ramadan has come and people uh, are, are suffering. Um, in terms of what they need not to be hungry. Um, then I've highlighted this, but I will quickly skip them. I will have to read everything. Senegal, 
Um, the only African country I understand that has never had a coup. But uh, President uh, Makisal almost brought it to his knees because he refused to step down at the end of his second term. He wanted a third term. And so that created confusion in Senegal. But it has been resolved now. There will be an election on, on Sunday. Uh, internationally, in terms of democracy, I think we also know that uh, the other country that has never had a coup um, is, is, um, is India. You know, India, after it was created, um, has never had a coup, a coup d'etat. Um, so, so that is the good news from 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 Kate from Senegal, and then I'll move on to to uh, with sports. Apparently, um, a lot of sports people have mental health issues, and now in South Africa, a lot of them are coming out and and talking about it. Um, 20, 30 years ago, when you talked about your mental health, people didn't think it was right. Even in, the, in England, the NHS was created to deal with physical health and not mental health. But I think mental health has not been recognized uh, worldwide as an important issue. Um, then in terms of water, it turns out that all Africans do not have access to pipe, clean pipe bond water. And a lot of Africans are still relying on other public tap at uh, boreholes, pipe water in a yard or compound, a dark well, unprotected dark well, surface water like streams, lakes, and canals, springs, and other sources like a tanker truck bringing you water or rainwater or cut water. And there is the, the uh, data that is from Afro, Afro Barometer which was set up uh, by a, a, a Ghanaian a statistician and I think a South African. So they joined forces and set up an organization which uh, measures all kinds of things. And so that's the water situation. And then uh, the review looks at uh, teenage schools and Netflix. And then finally, the review is on the fact that women are not writing. We don't have enough women writing, especially uh, in nonfiction. And we have uh, two ladies, uh, Shayla Lawson uh, and um, Nanjala Niabola, who are both writing on what it means to travel. So that's very interesting. We need more women to write. That's what is the basic story there. And that is uh, many the news, and then it ends with an analysis of uh, King Leslie the Third of Lesotho, who is a ceremonial head of state of Lesotho, and um, this is on the democratic governance on the continent. As you know, we have, if you like, three basic types of governance on the continent. There is the American presidential system. There is the UK. Um, uh, prime minister or party political system, which Lesotho is practicing. And then we have the third one, which is the, the, the if you like, uh, the executive, uh, executive monarchs like Morocco and Swaziland. And these are, so this story is about uh, the, 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 more, more, uh, the Lesotho situation and the fact that uh, like the UK, some would say, uh, it has created instability because uh, governments are changed sometimes in two in two years, one and a half years. So the monarch is stable, but the political system itself is unstable. So that that is the news. Um, I will summarize it by saying that um, what it's telling us is that the um, negative forces on the continent outweigh the positive forces. And I use the data section of the newspaper to basically make that point, which is the one on water. So I'm just trying to scroll up now to that data. So what this data is telling us is that on across the entire African continent, the welfare of the people is not supreme. The welfare of the people is largely being neglected by um, their government, their, their elected or, non, or unelected governments. And for us in conscientism, um, 
the, the statistics, when they show that the majority of Africans have access to things like drinking water, uh, clean drinking water, pipe borne water, say 85 to 90 percent, 95, well, even 100 percent of Africans have access to pipe borne water, then we will say that, then we can say that uh, positive forces are on the side of Africa. But as long as the, the data remains so, it means that negative forces are still dominating Africa. And by negative forces, we mean the forces that don't want Africa to use its wealth for the benefit of Africans. And um, perhaps uh, before Brother, uh, brother uh, Satish shares, um, shares um, his presentation or talks to us, it may be a, a good uh, uh, time to, to share a video, a short video that uh, Sister Ida, who is a co-chair here, um, shared with us in, in our coordinators group. And it's a story on, on it's a video on, on Haiti. And I think it would be nice to share that. Uh, it's, it's not long. We will not watch it. But I think that it will be nice to hear it. So, so, so here, here is a here's a video. I will share it, and then and then brother Satish will speak half after that. Whoa. sixty cents per hour. Is it on February tenth, twenty twenty two? Um, is that, Ida, is that clear? Did you know there are clear? over three hundred U.S. companies that are current. Is the video clear? Can yes. everyone hear it? Yes, Excellent. it is. And also, Excellent. look, um, Brother Joseph has sent you the song he wants. Excellent. So, okay. guys, let's, let's hear this uh, uh, video in Haiti, and then very interesting. And then Brother Tatish will, will tell us about the, the history, where this is all coming from in terms of the history. So here we go. Did you know there are over 300 U.S. companies that are currently operating in Haiti? Despite Haiti being known as the poorest country in the Caribbean, numerous American companies have been active on its shores since the initial U.S. invasion in 1915. These companies often pay their workers 550 gourds or 533 for 12 hours of labor, equating to a mere 60 cents per hour. On February 10, 2022, the predominantly female workers of the National Society of Industrial Parks, or SONAPI, peacefully protested, demanding improved wages and working conditions. However, they were met with deadly force from the Haitian National Police, or PNH, under the command of Franz Elbe, aiming to protect the interests of U.S.-branded merchandise companies. The protesters were advocating for a daily wage of 1,500 Haitian gourds, equivalent to 14 U.S. dollars, to sustain a decent standard of living. Shockingly, the PNH responded with live ammunition, brutally attacking the women who dared to demand better treatment and fair compensation. Some of these companies include PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, Radio Shack, FedEx, J.C. Penney, Kmart, Target, Walmart, Culligan Water, McDonald's, Nepe Auto Parts, Avis Rent-A-Car, Hertz, Dollar Tree, Budget Car Rental, Crowley, Domino's Pizza, Marriott, and Best Western. Additionally, there are companies like GTE, TRW Inc., AC, Nielsen, Gulf and Western, and Kelly Reed. Haiti has effectively become a colony for the U.S. economy, akin to a plantation in plain sight. From garment production to food and oil, the American way of life is heavily reliant on Haitian labor. When you hear about the U.S. deploying troops to Haiti to safeguard American interests, it refers to this economic dependency. See. So, now we know. <laughs> uh, thank you. Let me stop sharing that. And then I'm um, we'll into the chat now Bella, 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 to coming. play the song. Bella, coming. Yes, yes. I think yes, brother the Joseph. song, because it would set us, would set the tone but I yeah. yeah, that's what I'm trying to. I'm trying to find a song now. I believe I found it. It's a YouTube. It's on YouTube. Once it's up, I will share. Nice. It's, lo it's loading at the moment. So let me there share the screen. And well, Sachi should have now had enough time to put his thoughts together. <laughs> <laughs> right here we go. Here is the the song. Very inspiring, I believe. Yeah, here we go. Oh. Thank you. 
Thank you all for listening. Uh, we shall now move to Brother Satish to do his presentation. Brother Satish, uh, over to you, sir. Hey, well, uh, I'm going to start with the importance of the Haitian Revolution of 1791 to 1804. And the reason is it is important to understand the context 
before dealing with the main issue, which is Haiti is not a failed state. It is a sabotaged or wrecked state. It was deliberate, the actions of uh, <clears throat> the uh, advanced, so-called advanced nations, because it could not risk Haiti being a success. If Haiti succeeded, it would have been an inspiration for the rest of the world to overthrow slavery and show that it is quite possible and easy, in fact, for a black nation to govern itself and do so successfully. But the Haitian Revolution did not start in 1791. It started <clears throat> with resistance to the uh, colonial situation that it found itself in. Haiti was one of the most brutal regimes, if that was possible, during the history of the transatlantic slave trade. It was deliberately and maliciously brutal. The lives of the uh, enslaved were so cheap that it was never able to establish roots. So slavery never took hold because you had to replenish the uh, stock of uh, workers because you worked them so hard, they would die very, very quickly. It was excessively brutal. And that meant you had to import new enslaved people. And these people had a memory and recollection of life before the infliction of the transatlantic slave trade. This is one of the reasons why the revolution happened in Haiti. <clears throat> now, it is important to note that Haiti was a very, very, very successful colony for France. In 1787, two years before the French Revolution began, it contributed to thirds of France's colonial income on its own. That's how successful a colony it was. And that explains not just its success, but why it was such a coveted place. The rest of the world, the colonial powers that is, wanted Haiti for themselves. It was massively coveted. And it led to one of the most remarkable events in human history. <clears throat> Nowhere else is there any example of an untrained army of the disenfranchised not only managing to master military tactics and the arts of war, but they were able to defeat the three military superpowers of the time. Nobody else had achieved that previously, and nobody has achieved it subsequently. <clears throat> it is therefore one of the great events in human history. This revolution, like I said, did not actually begin in August 1791 with uh, the call of uh, Dutty Bookman and a lesser known leading light of the revolution who shared the call was a lady by the name of Cecile Fatima. Her history itself is a very, very interesting thing and I would encourage you to read up on her. She had a very, very long life, took part in the revolution and she had longevity. She married a veteran of the revolutionary struggle who went on to become the last veteran of the struggle to become president of Haiti himself. That was several decades after the revolution succeeded. But again, before the that time, before the revolution began in August 1791, there were crucial events 
which foreshadowed the well not foreshadowed sorry which predicted in its way the revolution and how it was going to happen you had a racist system and that's not just uh, in terms of the slavery it is in terms of the a divide and rule that was there from a very very long time you had french colonial planters who were the elite they had the power they had the resources and they were brutal in maintaining it but a lot of them had relations with uh, black women in particular and this created a second tier of uh, oppression but also a tier of potential liberation which is the mixed race they were known as mulattoes they wanted political rights which they didn't have the their parents i.e the plant the white planters were prepared in some cases to acknowledge them but they were never prepared to share power with them they would possibly give them an education but they rarely allowed them to use their names and they gave them no real power even though like i say some of them were more conducive to giving them certain rights but it was never on an equal basis but the mixed race saw themselves as ready to share power with their fathers <clears throat> and that's what they wanted so when the french revolution occurred in 1789 they saw their chance you had leaders such as uh, vincent Auger and jean baptiste chavin and the latter deserves much much more recognition than he receives because while he fought with Auger, while he shared Auger's brutal fate while he was being tortured to death he spent his time demanding an end to slavery and this is while being tortured to death Chavin is one of the unsung heroes of the Haitian revolution and he showed that it was possible to unite with the black community and that they would have been much more potent as a force had they followed Chavan rather than Ogay. They were both brutally executed in February 1791, just a few months before the revolution begins. This is of great importance because that divide between the mixed race and the enslaved blacks would come back and haunt the revolution at various points in time. But it is massively important to note that the revolution wasn't just about Toussaint Louverture, it wasn't just about Jean-Jacques Dessalines and the some of the <clears throat> better known leaders. It actually began in its way in the American War of Independence. There was a brigade of volunteers from Haiti les chaussures and it involved some french people such as uh le vicomte de rochambeau who becomes very important later in this story and it also involves andre rigo among others and if you look at the savannah monument it took over two centuries to get this monument to, and that is about the contribution of the Haitians in particular to the American War of Independence, i.e. Les Chasseurs. It involved a number of uh, people who went on to play important roles in the Haitian Revolution. But it is essential to remember this because it shows from a very early stage the contribution of Haiti to the United States. And it gets no proper recognition for it. In fact, it gets the opposite. If you look at the Savannah Monument, you will see uh, 
in there, there is a drummer boy. That drummer boy is a young Henri Christophe, who goes on to become one of the leaders of the Haitian Revolution. And unfortunately, he becomes king of northern Haiti and institutes a backward looking regime of uh, himself as king, appointing people as uh, barons and uh, lords within his government, which was a retrograde step. It was when you consider that the revolution was about freeing everybody that it could and defending their rights, you never should have had a king. <clears throat> Christoph becomes a problem, but that's much, much, much later. But it is very important to recognize the contribution of the Haitians to American independence in the War of Independence, and they never got proper gratitude for it. They also played a very, very important role in the development of the United States. You have to bear in mind that uh, the United States, when it won its independence from Britain, was a very, very, very small country. It was just 13 states on the eastern seaboard of the, what is now the United States. It managed to double or treble its size at the stroke of a pen. What is not realized is that that is due entirely to the Haitian Revolution. And the reason I say that is we're talking about the Louisiana Purchase. The original plan of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte was to use the Louisiana territories, which is essentially bordered what was then Mexico, with, uh, you know, took the borders up to Texas, New Mexico, Arizona in particular, which later helped the United States when it went to war with Mexico after that the latter country's independence as well. And that led in turn to it developing, uh, well, becoming close to the California and its ultimate size. Without the Haitian Revolution, there is absolutely no way the United States would have become a superpower at least as quickly as it did, which means we would be living in a completely different world. So how does the United States respond at that time and subsequently to Haiti? Now, I refer quite a lot to a debt that can never be repaid. And I'm not really referring to the outrageous indemnity that was imposed on Haiti by France and also the United States. I'm referring to the development of the United States itself, which could never have happened if it hadn't been for Haiti revolution and its contribution. This resulted in them being strangled Economically, the United States had a very, very tough time after independence. It had very, very few trading partners that it could deal with. You either had to deal with the French or the British. Haiti offered a third way. And that third way gave them much, much better terms of trade than they had got from France and they had got from Britain. And what was their reaction to it? They knew of Napoleon Bonaparte's plans to restore slavery in Haiti and in, it, in the French domain. Instead of warning the revolutionaries that this was on the cards, they kept quiet. Some people say Thomas Jefferson did that because he was kowtowing to southern slave owners. But that does a little bit of a disservice. Jefferson is not the uh, anti-slavery figure that he has been cut out to be. 
he passed legislation that made it illegal to refer to Haiti's revolution because they were so scared that it would provide an example against slavery. Two events in American history bear this out, that somehow both the Denmark VZ conspiracy, as it is known, but it really shouldn't be, it was an organized, an organized attempt to overthrow slavery. That was in, uh, I believe it's in the uh, Carolinas, one of the Carolinas, and uh, it also inspired the Nat Turner revolt, which is quite a famous one in 1831. So even though they were scared of the example that uh, the Haitian Revolution provided, they were unable to prevent people from hearing about it. So it played a huge role in the fight against slavery in the United States and elsewhere. Where this becomes massively, massively important is the credit that is due to the Haitian Revolution for the world that, that we now live in, in shaping it, is never truly given. You simply need to look at the events during the revolution itself. As I said, it is the only example of the three military superpowers of the time being defeated. And by an untrained army is absolutely incredible. This is absolutely outrageous. You simply see a level of racism that is incredible because during the revolution, as I said several times, they beat the three military superpowers of the time. That is Britain, France and Spain. And they did it with brilliant military tactics. In 1812, people view the tactics of Mikhail Kutuzov as absolute genius because he <laughs> recognized that Russia had very little chance of defeating Napoleon in a pitched battle. So it required different tactics. And the tactics were they would hit and run. They would fight a guerrilla war. They would destroy. They would scor use scorched earth <laughs> because they knew that they had, <clears throat> I'm sorry, they had a weapon that would even the odds and possibly give victory. That was the Russian winter. That allowed them to extend the supply lines and attack it, cut the supply lines and let the winter do its work. It resulted in what was considered the first great defeat suffered by Napoleon Bonaparte. Well, this is not true. There were other defeats, but the first significant, really significant defeat suffered by Bonaparte happened when he wasn't actually there. It was the Haitian Revolution. And it is an example of how bad Napoleon was as a war leader. No doubt about it, he was a great general in terms of uh, the achievements such as the Battle of Austerlitz in particular in 1805 was genius from a military standpoint. But he had already blotted his copybook a full decade before the uh, Russian campaign. The way he blotted his copybook, you have to go back a little bit further. And that is in 1794, the Prime Minister of Britain. Yeah, yeah? Excellent. Sorry. Yeah, you are off for a few seconds. Uh, we are happy to see you back. <laughs> oh, sorry. 
<laughs> it's okay. Let me just check. I haven't uh, messed up my connection. No, it's okay. Uh, in 1793, General Maitland invaded Haiti from Jamaica. It was part of the British policy to seize Haiti. And this is very, very important. If Haiti was so unimportant, why did they spend over four years trying to colonize it? Originally, William Pitt the Younger introduced a plan to abolish slavery in the 1790s because he saw an opportunity to take advantage of Haiti's revolution to <clears throat> undermine French, the French connections in Haiti. It got thwarted by Sontonax, the French governor uh, who was sent over by the Jacobins to retain control. <clears throat> and Sontanax realized the way you would get the support of Haiti as it then became or as it became was to abolish slavery. It led to a complete rethink of the British strategy. They then decided we're not going to abolish slavery. What we're going to do is try and seize Haiti. It became one of the biggest military disasters in British history. By April of 1798, bear in mind the date, April 30th, 1798, an accord was signed between Maitland and Toussaint Louverture. That accord was <clears throat> the British were going to withdraw and in return, the Haitians were not going to fight for uh, fight them in Jamaica to go abolish slavery there as well. <clears throat> but the key thing is, as far as military historians are concerned, certain ones anyway, the only reason the Haitians defeated the British was they got lucky. And they got lucky because yellow fever did the job for them. What is the difference? between the Haitian use of yellow fever and the Russians' use of the winter. You don't say Mikhail Kutuzov got lucky because the Russian winter just happened to wipe out Napoleon's forces. You say that what a brilliant military tactic that was. And it was repeated in the Second World War, where the Russian winter again played a crucial part in defeating Nazism. But it wasn't a case of the Russian winter acting in isolation. It was a military tactic. It was used to perfection as a military tactic. Again, what is the difference between the Russian use of the winter and Haitian use of yellow fever? Now, Napoleon's big mistake is in 1798, Britain was at its weakest. It was vulnerable, the most vulnerable it had ever been. There were links at that point in, well, in 1797, between Wolf Tone of the United Irishmen and French Revolution. He even met with Napoleon. Napoleon wasn't that interested, and he probably should have been. But the timing of the United Irishmen revolt is very, very interesting. May 1798. In other words, they strike at Britain's weakest moment because of the Haiti campaign. It's never been acknowledged to what extent they knew about it and whether they planned it because of this. But the timing is too great to simply be a coincidence. So it had this effect instead of actually understanding that this had tipped the odds against Britain, who was the most implacable opponent of the, the French Revolution and Napoleon in particular, Napoleon decides in 1802, when they have 
the, the Treaty of Amiens. Both sides need to re recuperate. Britain does. France doesn't. What Napoleon does is repeat the British mistake. He decides that he can reinstate slavery in Haiti and seize it back. Again, if Haiti was such a disaster, why did the French want it back that badly? Well, the reason is it wasn't a disaster. They had actually set <clears throat> itself, uh, its economy, back on an even keel. It had reached two-thirds of the pre-revolution economy. And that's in the middle of a war, a long-standing war. <clears throat> Immediately after Britain loses this attempt to seize Haiti, racism plays a part in undermining the Haitian Revolution in that <clears throat> the mixed race and the blacks have a serious falling out in what is termed the War of Knives. It ends in 1800 with the utter defeat of the mixed race people who flee to France. They, among them, is uh, General Rigo and uh, a man called Alexandre Sabez Petion, who becomes one of the great unsung heroes of the Haitian Revolution, but not just of the Haitian Revolution, of the fight against enslavement and the fight for liberation of uh, several colonies. Petion is one of the great unsung heroes and he's <clears throat> no less a figure than Simon Bolivar received great assistance from the Haitian president, uh, which is Alexander Pétion, from 1807 until his death in 1818. Pétion was the president of the southern part of uh, Haiti. It split in yet another civil war <clears throat> between uh, the mixed race uh, Pétion and his supporters and the uh, feudalist supporting regime of uh, Henri Christophe in the north. The end result of this was after Pétion's death, two years later, the southern part was on the, the doorstep of uh, the North, Christophe suffered a stroke and killed himself in 1820. <clears throat> that led to the unification of Haiti under uh, Jean-Pierre Boyer. He becomes very important later because he actually manages to seize control of what is now the Dominican Republic as well. The island of Hispaniola was united until 1844 <clears throat> from that uh, boy the time boyer succeeds in f five years into boyer's rule haiti is held totally to ransom this is the outrageous indemnity that indemnity was put in place in order to destroy Haiti. It was meant to punish them for having succeeded in overthrowing slavery, but it was also designed to economically cripple them. And it was designed to cripple them on a permanent basis. We're still seeing the consequences <clears throat> of that indemnity. The value that they put on compensating the slave owners was completely arbitrary and well over the amount that they were due. The amount demanded was deliberately designed to force Haiti at gunpoint, literally. They had warships off the coast 
of Haiti and threatened to bomb them, uh, well, not bomb them, but to uh, blast them into oblivion if they did not agree to pay this indemnity. So they did so with no real choice but to do so. This was designed to put them into debt because they had to borrow the money from French banks. Not only do they get extorted for having the temerity to overthrow colonialism and enslavement, but they have to pay twice. They pay the compensation, which is an outrage, and they have to pay interest on the loans they are forced to take out. Later, the United States gets in on the act and buys the debt. So they now have to pay American banks as well. The end result is that they only finish repaying <clears throat> after the Second World War. The cost of this is enormous. In today's money, it is estimated that it was $21 billion. Actually, you could say it's even, even bigger because this has affected its ability to develop its economy. If they didn't have this money extorted from it, it would almost certainly have been a successful economy and they would have earned much, much more. So you are talking something in the region of 100 billion easily in terms of how much it's been it's cost to get back to the achievements of the revolution uh, in the short term napoleon brought over mixed race people as part of his invasion force under his brother-in-law charles leclerc and <clears throat> the policy was they were assured that they were going to restore the uh, previous regime of, of sorts, never saying we're going to bring back slavery, but they gave the mixed race contingent the belief that power was going to be shared with them. The big mistake, or one of the big mistakes that Napoleon made is he did not learn the lesson of Haiti from the British failure in Haiti. Eventually, the same thing was done to the French. They, the timing of the actions of Louverture and the others, other revolutionaries, coincided with the outbreak of yellow fever. Is this some kind of accident? Not only do they achieve these victories over the British by using yellow fever as a military tactic, they did it again. That is how they beat the French, who did not understand that these people knew what they were doing. Now, as I said before, nobody says the Russians got lucky by using their winter as a military weapon and a tactic. Again, what is the difference between the Russian use of the winter and the Haitians' use of yellow fever? Eventually, oh, Napoleon makes another mistake, and that mistake is the arrest of Toussaint Louverture. He was arrested by subterfuge deported to France and dies of neglect deliberately. But shortly after that, André Rigo is deported as well. At this point, Napoleon achieves his greatest achievement in Haiti. He unites the mixed race and the formerly enslaved to fight French attempts to restore slavery. Petion realizes he's been duped. 
he knows they're not going to share power and that they were just used as cannon fodder to try to restore the previous regime. He's not having it. He secretly meets with Henri Christophe and Dessalines. And that's where the Haiti's flag comes in. If you notice, it's blue and red. The white of the French tricolour was torn out by those three revolutionaries. That is why Haiti's flag is blue and red. <clears throat> so that, uh, sorry, brother Satish, are you about to conclude so that um, um, people, have, people have questions for you? So I'm sure <laughs> um, uh, you, you've, you've gone past half an hour now. <laughs> all right, um, then let me. Um, it's fine. You can uh, let me just tie it up. Uh, yeah, tie it quickly, up. So and that, then, uh, that's uh, fine. Like I said, this is never going to finish. In yeah, a, that's fine. In a, we'll another session. In one session. Yeah. But basically, the the whole point of what I'm trying to say is this is one of the most remarkable events in human history. And it is no accident that Haiti has been treated the way it's been treated. It needs a concerted effort. Africa, in particular, needs to start understanding the slave trade didn't end with people being stolen from Africa. It simply transported that issue to the Americas in particular and across the Atlantic Ocean in the transatlantic slave trade. Hmm. Haiti needs to be seen as the beacon of liberation that it really is. And from the ruins of a sabotaged, wrecked state needs to emerge the beacon of hope that Haiti really was. Mm. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think you have you have uh, uh, positioned the Haiti Revolution very well in terms of where Africa itself should be going. I'm sure we um, shall hear from you more on aspects of Haiti that we need to to know. I mean. Uh, I mean, you spoke extempore. I'm not sure you were reading anything. <laughs> it's it's as all if in um, yes, it's as if you were uh, you were there <laughs> when all when all this happened. <laughs> no, th thank you very much. Um, so, um, brothers and sisters, um, the floor is not opened initially for any questions, and then we'll open the floor for other other contributions. Um, just checking that the um, participants have seen that any hands up. Ooh. Um, Brother Satish, a few hands are up. I hope you are ready, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's start with uh, Sister Aida. <laughs> Thank you. Brother, Brother <laughs> Satish, I'm interested in the fact that you mentioned yellow fever twice. Um, but I always thought, or what I've heard of yellow fever is that it's a fly, it's a mosquito. And it's like among the trees. So um, maybe you could explain the the connection between yellow fever, which you believe is how um, the French were destroyed twice, not once, but twice. Maybe you could tell us a bit more about that, if you have any ideas, please, on that. Thank you. Um, well, I don't really know uh, too much about how yellow fever is spread, but uh, can uh, I, brother, brother Tish, Can I can I help you here? Uh, according to I've just googled, it says that scientists believe that yellow fever evolved in Africa around three thousand years ago. Uh, yellow fever was imported to the West Hemisphere on slave ships from West Africa. Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but let me just slightly Sorry, correct but, you. But hold on one minute. Does it go on a bit further, um, brother? Kwame and, and say that it has something to do with malaria, the uh, mosquitoes. Um, not, not as far. Because I think it's a mosquito um, vector that causes it. So that's why I was interested in. Mm. Anyway, let yeah, I, I was just helping brother, brother Satish there. So, um, I'm happy to 
So, I mean, there's a history of yellow fever on the screen. I'm sure I'm sharing that if you're interested. But anyway, Brother Satish, carry on. <clears throat> uh, I think you have to let me back again. Well, are you out? Um, oh, well, I yeah, can't see, uh, while this is shared. Uh, yeah, I'm happy. Yeah, I've stopped it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, where am I? <laughs> okay. Well, <clears throat> the, the thing, let me just slightly correct uh, Sister Ida. The what I said is they used yellow fever twice. Napoleon lost for the set the second time they used yellow fever as a military tactic. The first time was against the British. And what I the point I was making with this is that I find it completely and utterly outrageous that it is used to diminish the achievement of the Haitian revolutionaries. They knew what they were doing. The timing of uh, their military actions and the uh, it being at the outbreak of the yellow fever season makes it clear they knew exactly what they were doing. They were using the local conditions as a military weapon, exactly the same as the Russians did twice in the Second World War and against Napoleon. Now, Napoleon really ought to have learned his lesson because he, the, <clears throat> when he did, did the, the Russia campaign, he actually thought that he was going to get out before the Russian winter hit. He knew about it. So how does he not know about yellow fever and the, the way it had been used. It gave him an advantage and he was too stupid to use it. So when people talk about how brilliant Napoleon was as a tactician, military tactician, was he? How could you make this mistake when you have actually seen the devastating effect that it had on <clears throat> the British attempt to seize Haiti and that it had actually brought Britain to a position where it was the most vulnerable it had ever been during the French Revolutionary Wars against it. This was my main point. It is ridiculous that Haiti doesn't get given the credit and that it's revolutionary, don't get given the credit they deserve. Thank, thank you very much. Let's hear from, let's hear, I think I just have questions for you. Uh, the next question is from Brother Joseph. Yeah, first of <laughs> all, thank you, Brother Fashis, for your brilliant uh, presentation, albeit without notes. Um, a few a few points of interest, and then I'll ask the question. Um, for one, it is said that the uh, U.S. first invaded Haiti in 2015. My information is that since 1880, they've been meddling directly in Haitian affairs, invading Haiti. And then also that it, it, took, they took, it took the Americans 60 years before they first recognized the state of Haiti. And then another point of interest, that it was still until 2015 that uh, Haiti stopped uh, paying the, the indemnity that was put on them. Now, Belashashis, in terms of um, similarity with Shuba, in terms of how Haiti has, has been uh, um, dismantled or is there wrecked, is there a similar pattern that has been done against Cuba? And I would venture <laughs> to say that Grenada is not without uh, similarity. In fact, we are operating at a lower intensity, a low, a low intensity in terms of punishing Grenada for having the first, in, first revolution in the English speaking Caribbean. Thank you very much for your response. <clears throat> I would say there are certainly similarities in the way Cuba was treated and Grenada is treated, but that Haiti was worse in that the other two never had the indemnity crippling their economy. They had sanctions, but you can't tell somebody who they can trade with. What you, you know, essentially, 
in the current situation, you can trade with whoever you want. So they were able to put blockade on Cuba. But Haiti was different. They didn't just try to blockade it. They tried to destroy its economy by putting it into debt. And this is very, very important because as uh, uh, the chair, uh, Brother uh, Kwame, Bra said, yeah, Brother Kwame yes. in the, at the start, they tried this in Africa. They tried to destroy the uh, basis of Africa's economy if they didn't agree to uh, basically be a semi-colonial, neo-colonial state and tied to the French economy. They did that because they got away with it in Haiti. And this is partly why Africa needs to stand up with Haiti and say, we're not going to let you do this. You have succeeded up to this point. Now it ends. Now, Haiti is going to be embraced by the whole of the African, led by the African community and the Caribbean, to basically say it is time for restitution. Haiti must be restored to the state that it should have been in. That is the starting point. It's not the end. It's the starting point. Thank, thank you so much. Let's have let's get another question from um, from from someone else who was hands also up. So we've got brother um, Michael uh, five five X. Uh, yeah, brother Michael, over to you. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry to sorry to interrupt. Jay, is there an order of things? Because I, yes, I was I'm going. Before, um, yeah, I'm just going. Yeah, but I'm, you know, I'm just going by the um, the hands up on my screen. Yes. Well, mine was up before. Um, I, I, I spoke I, last. Sorry, it's just yeah. No, sorry about that. But um, I'll call you after, brother, brother Michael. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Yes. Um. Yeah. Fantastic. Um. Introduction and, and um. My thing is, um, did voodoo play a part in how they, why they were successful? <laughs> The answer to that is yes. Dutty Bookman and Cecil Fatiman were voodoo leaders, uh, for want of a better way of putting it. Uh, Bookman was a priest. I'm not sure exactly what. Uh, so yeah, sorry, sorry, brother, brother Satish, can I come in there? So uh, the the word in my language, that word is my language, is voodoo, <laughs> and voodoo is uh, is a is an African, basically the African priests, put it that way. <laughs> yeah, I know it originally came from Africa, but its role within the Haitian Revolution was at uh, Bois Cayman, where Bukman makes the call to revolution, along with Cecil Fatiman. Both of them were uh, leaders of the uh, the voodoo uh, re religion. I don't know how you're supposed to uh, refer to it and what their positions were, <clears throat> but they were both leaders within the, that faith and it played an important part. It was the start of the Haitian revolution. So voodoo was important, certainly. Hmm. Can I also mention that... Um, Thank you, brother. Uh, yeah, another way to... Um, called uh, to pronounce the word is voodoo. Uh, okay. Voodoo basically, basically, basically is all the scientific tools that you can use to free a nation. That's voodoo. That's what it literally means. So it's not magic. It's not mm -hmm. uh, about um, um, some kind of uh, uh, dark arts. And it's basically what scientific tools can we use to free a nation. Uh, Brother Glenroy, thank you. Thank you. Um, Sitesh, I'm not sure how far I would go down the road with you uh, in what it sounds like you're describing a sort of uh, um, genetic warfare in regard to yellow fever. I think that's more the benefit of using the terrain. So in that way, it does 
uh, replicate or <clears throat> similar uh, with the situation uh, that you uh, uh, put as, as far as the Russian winter is concerned. Um, because I don't suppose there were IET uh, uh, revolutionary going around infecting <laughs> French soldiers. But I understand the point you're trying to make. Um, but I put my hand up to really ask, uh, I, I had hoped that there would be a more up-to-date uh, uh, analysis, and I appreciate time, you can't cover everything, um, but I, I, I would wonder in about the uh, fact that the so-called Molotov, uh, when the um, penalty of payment was, was administrated, that they were chief administrator of the that and in fact they, they, there was a, a three tier uh, uh, system ended up in in IET and I wondered uh, if um, you had anything to say about I think you mentioned a little bit of it the country that they created uh, just across the border and its continued role in the um, uh, 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 treatment of IET. So I appreciate that time perhaps doesn't allow it, but I wonder if we can make some current analysis because I think that's the thing that interests a lot of people. Where are we going now? And what lessons can we learn to ensure that the people that are in IET don't continue the suffering that they are currently being subjected to? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so sorry, before Brother Sachis comes in, can I also mention that we had um, in, in this session, we had raised three questions, the past of Haiti, the present of Haiti, and the future of Haiti. Yeah. And I had personally, uh, did mention, I personally did mention that we should look at the future of Haiti within the, uh, in the context of the past and the present. But it was clear to us that some of our members wanted a sense of the history first. So what about that such, such as has done today is, is to look at the history. So if, as you are saying, blah, blah, that Glenroy, you want uh, a current analysis, and I think that should be our next session mm -hmm. where we look where we look at current analysis. But if Brother Satish wants to say something, but that's fine. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, we will we will, we will have uh, another session where we look at the current analysis. Thank you. Uh, let me first uh, correct uh, Brother Glenroy by actually agreeing with him. I never suggested or meant it to be suggested that the Haitians were running around with uh, vials of yellow fever to inject into the French and the British. I was saying they knew that yellow fever tended to hit at a particular time, and they made use of it to plan their tactics, their military tactics around the uh, yellow fever season and used it as a weapon. Not that they were doing using germ warfare or anything like it. It was simply a tactic <clears throat> that they adopted to great mm. effect. They used the local conditions, which mm. was their equivalent of the Russian winter was yellow fever. In response to your <clears throat> point about uh, a more recent uh, analysis, uh, I had actually said right at the start there was no way we were going to be able to uh, complete the uh, original plan because the topic is just too big. Uh, so I suggested we start with the history, <clears throat> which uh, I hope I've done today. Uh, in response to your uh, point about uh, <clears throat> the uh, mixed race Use it, agreeing to the indemnity. That is true, they did. But they did so with a gun, literally, at their head. There really wasn't any great choice at that time because the French warships were there ready to blast Haiti into oblivion if they did not agree to it. There wasn't a choice. So I don't think that... Uh, it comes down to a race thing, except in terms of it being a racist thing to deliberately destroy Haiti's prospects. Hmm. Uh, th thank you. Yes, yes, Isaida, I was going to mention that, yes, it, it is spread by mosquito. 
And um, uh, Brother Satish, in fairness to you, when you use the analogy of the Russian winter, that was my understanding that you were saying they use local conditions. I didn't understand it to mean that you were suggesting that they were waging some kind of chemical warfare. So in fairness to you. Right, let's go to Brother Everton, please. <clears throat> Brother Everton. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, I'll just like to go back and touch on the point of, or the subject of Vodum. Mm. Um, so, so is I mean, it a question for Brother Satish, or are you making your own point? <clears throat> a, a point and a comment from how I learned the, the history of the Asian revolution and battles. Okay, so it's not a question for Brother Sati, is that correct? It's not directly, no. Okay, can it's you hold on? Can, yeah, can you hold on with that thought? Let's see if anybody has a question, and I'll let you come first with comments and so on. Is that okay? Not a problem. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we've got um, Shazar X. Please, is it a question for Brother Satish? If yeah, just carry All right, please Couple carry question. All right, so uh, Greetings, all. Yeah, just a couple of questions. Uh, Cecile, uh, that was mentioned. I just wanted to know, why isn't she as well known? Um, also, with Bookman, did he die after the revolution or was it before? And then the final question, uh, with this yellow fever. Um, well... Germ, germ warfare, or whatever they call it. Could we not get hold of some of this um, yellow fever, bottle it, and use it against this um, current terrorism that we're all under? So those are my questions. <laughs> well, well, Satish, you like to unmute yourself. Um, can we <clears throat> bottle yellow fever? <laughs> well, <laughs> Even if the your third question would be tempting, they have a vaccine. <laughs> and <clears throat> uh, to answer your other two questions, the reason I can only surmise that Cecil Fatiman is not recognised as much as she should be <clears throat> is a combination of racism and sexism. You're not supposed to have powerful women, certainly not in the 18th century, but you did. So you write her out of history as a means of uh, keeping everybody who's supposed to be kept in their place in their place. The only problem is you can't do it because the knowledge of her is there. It's simply a case of people need to look it up, the facts about her, and spread them. In terms of uh, Dutty Bookman, he died very early in the revolution. Certainly, in seven, by 1791, the end, end of 1791, he was uh, killed. And it was a pretty violent end that uh, he had. But by that stage, there were other leaders emerging. For example, Toussaint Louverture did not start in support of the Haitian Revolution. He was uh, over in the Spanish part of the island, <clears throat> and he was waiting. He waited until the French abolished slavery before he came over to the French side. And the revolution progressed along those lines. It's actually quite interesting that uh, <clears throat> another of the revolution's contradictory figures is a man called Georges Biasu, and he stayed loyal to Spain, even after Spain su supported the anti-revolution side of it. <clears throat> Biasu never fully came over, but he was an important part. Louverto viewed him as a role model to start with. So it is a case of there are so many different people who need to be properly recognized. And you have to understand that uh, revolutions have a tendency 
to make people do things that they otherwise wouldn't do. But it also throws up remarkable events. Like there, there is one who you may have heard of or may not, I don't know. His name is Francois Capois. And he was referred to in the midst of the Battle of Vertier as the Black Achilles. And that came from no less a figure than the leader of the French <clears throat> forces, Le Vicomte de Rochambeau. What happened was Brother, brother Satish, to see it looks, a... brother Satish, mm -hmm. it looks like you have a lot. <laughs> so hold, hold your fire. Let's get um, other. There are other questions. Uh, questioners who want to okay. ask questions. I Can I just I've, finish? I think you've addressed with, uh, Francois Capois. But I think you've addressed um, Shaza's question. So I think mm -hmm. you can ask other questions. Let's go to Dekin Maui. Okay. When, when you do so, when you do your next session, please feel free to cover that. Okay. <laughs> um, Dekin, <clears throat> ask your question, please. He's Mauli? Muted. Uh, yeah, maybe he's not even speaking. Mauli. Uh, Mauli's not ready. So let's go to. Uh, it's not. It's got Ethiopian Swahili community. No, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Hello. Sorry. All right. Ask your question, please. Right. Yeah. So, um, my question to uh, Adam Satish is, uh, Adam, please, please. I had to say, Lavete has a, a mother, uh, from uh, Benin who raised him, who was actually a voodoo priestess, and that was why he had that strength, supernatural strength. And as uh, brother, uh, brother, the chairman was saying, Kwame, uh, would do this liberation to liberate your your your, mm. your town. Mm. However, mm. what crafts did he use to 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 do that? What is the craft? So two questions, both both to you, the chairman, and also the brother Satish. Uh, I'm sorry, you, you're you referring to Tuzan Uvertu? Yes. Yes. And yes. Either Tuzan Uvertu or one of the book, not book, book, but one of them. I think said... it was Bookman, is the, the one you're actually uh, referring mm. to. He had, uh, well, Bookman was partly involved as an overseer under the previous regime. <clears throat> At some point, he turned into leader of the uh, revolution. He's the one who makes the call to effectively call to revolution, along with Cecil Fetiman. And Voodoo plays an important part in that. It was a ceremony at uh, Bois Cayman that uh, the revolution, where the revolution began. So. That is at least the origin, the original involvement of uh, voodoo in the uh, Haitian Revolution. As to exactly what role it played in his earlier life, I, I don't really know. It's mm. uh, something that uh, you could look up this uh, in the works of uh, people like Professor David Geggis, for example, and uh, a few others. There was a uh, thing called the Corbett List. I don't, I don't think it's still operational, but you might be able to find posts about it. It was one of the best sources of information about the Haitian Revolution that you could find. Hmm. Thank, yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, 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 Brother Mauro, your question to me, basically, um, the, the teachings of Sue. Hmm? Sue. Uh, which uh, in, in 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 English became fi fi philosophy. The, the philosophy means love for the teachings of Su. And you know Su 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 Busali Su. Uh, so is the name of of God, if you like. So that's where it comes from. Um, right. Let's go to uh, Ethiopian Swahili community. Yes. Good afternoon. How are you guys doing? I'm talking to you from Ethiopia. This Abeba, how are you all doing? Wonderful. We we are we are doing great. We heard about the the run on the banks. Uh, yeah, stealing money from the banks. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> yeah it happened. You know, uh, yeah, because we don't control technology, even though we are running through those. So 
Yeah, that's yeah. A someone is yeah. testing to see if they can get the money from it. So there you go, and it and it's, it worked. And anyway, your question to, to brother, <laughs> brother Satish. <laughs> yeah, so it's not actual one. Is it three of them? Um, one is that uh, here in Ethiopia we have what we call Adwa, victory which I hope a lot of you guys know about, uh, which is when uh, Ethiopia kicked uh, the butt of uh, Italians. And uh, Ethiopian government, most of even Ethiopians also are trying to advocate that to be included in most of African schools was something that has been advocated. So uh, are you guys in Haiti or Haiti trying to do the same uh, when it comes to Haitian revolution, are you planning to at least uh, for us black people globally to understand or to know about Haitian revolution? Because mm. obviously it's found in Norway. That is question number one. Mm. Question sorry, number two. Uh, sorry, before uh -huh. you go into question number two, let me ask, Brother Satish, you are not in Haiti, are you? I mean, that's I don't. That, that's not my understanding. No, I'm. Um, I'm not Haitian, and I'm not in Haiti. Not I'm Haitian. just exceptionally interested in yeah, it. He's just a okay. historian, a good historian. Okay, okay. Uh, the other question is also relating to that. You mentioned about voodoo or voodoo, uh, but you did not mention the importance of language during the Haitian Revolution. Is uh, Creole, uh, Haitian Creole language was a key to the Haitian Revolution or it didn't help at all? That's question number two. Question number three, uh, Haiti uh, is the only country that tried to join Africa Union and was rejected. I'm not exactly sure which year, I think it was around 2004. I'm not sure though, and it was rejected. So is Haiti no. uh, as a, a symbol of black liberation, having any other plan at least to do something that is relating to that? Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sorry, before brother Satish comes in. Um, brother, brother Ethiopia, um, when did um, Haiti apply? Do you know when Haiti applied to join the African Union? Do you know what year that was? Yes, I believe it was 2004. Okay, thank, thank you. Brother Satish, over to you. The answer to your first question is yes, Pio was uh, very, very important. It was the language of the revolution, and it remained the its language afterwards as well. So culturally, uh, it is very, very important. And uh, as uh, Comrade Pigeon can confirm, I actually wanted a translation of this into Creole. Mm. And and can yeah. I ask Brother Pigeon, whilst you answer the question? Brother Pigeon, is there a relationship between... Um... Creole and um, the language you are teaching when you do your, your no, teaching. They say Creole is a mock French. So it's a mock French language. It's a broken French language. Okay. But uh, it's not related. But it's possible for us to see how we can translate the content or the recording in terms of text into mm. Creole. Okay. Thank you. Brother Satish, carry on. Yeah. And so, uh, so, sorry. to your second sorry, question, sorry. it is. The point of this meeting is that I wanted to see African solidarity with Haiti better late than never. Mm. But it also is important historically because, as I'd said regarding Pétion, he is the real liberator. Even Simon Bolivar accepts that. In the Gran Colombia project of Bolivar, Haiti asked to join and the people dealing with it, this is after the death of Pétion because there's no way they would have actually refused if Pétion had asked. But <laughs> they decided not to wake up Bolivar. So they never got admitted when they really would, would and should have been. And that would also have affected the outcome because Haiti would have got the solidarity it needed at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Now Africa can do it. All right. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Sure. Well, Mary, you wanted to say something. Sure. Yeah, I just asked Cameron to check his information in regard to Haiti's status uh, as far as the African Union is concerned. Yeah, I'm what not do you sure, know, brother? but I think they've been granted. Well, my knowledge is that they were granted 
observer status, which is not good enough. It's not the one mm. they were applying for, but I think that's the current status. But I could be wrong. I, I'll leave it to people to look into that. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I would add that um, this is, I think we have to, we the progressives have to, based on this program and other programs, begin to call the African Union to, to give uh, Haiti not just an observer status, but we want it to be part of the African Union. When we, look at, when we look at the future of Haiti in the third segment, the next segment will be the current analysis, and then the third segment will be the future of Haiti. And I think there we should talk about these things and how, how Haiti should be should go beyond the, 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 the observer status and so on. Right, there are no other questions, so we shall now go to... Um, Brother Everton. So, so whoever, if your hand is, is now up, after Brother Everton speaks, I'll call you to share and you can ask questions or share your comment and so on. Brother Everton, um, thank you. We've got yeah, seven thank minutes. Thank you once left. again. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you once again. I was just about to leave. I'm almost <laughs> run that time. Oh, 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 oh so, 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 very sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just um, touching on <laughs> voodoo, voodoo, as ever it's pronounced. And it was quite interesting that we this the term was used as germ warfare uh, yeah, this do. evening because and scientific because it was mixed with spirituality. Mm. Um, when I was learning about the Asian Revolution and the fighting, mm. there was witness statements of um, soldiers. Um, having illusions of flying people flying through the air and all the rest of it and um you know the science used to poison the water and and also the spirituality side of it all combined and of course mm -hmm. the victories that were repeated over and over again no matter who came mm -hmm. what can we say right yeah yeah but, I mean, you know yeah yeah, the yeah, voodoo on, is yeah. not, yeah, it's not a spirituality thing on its own. It encompasses nature, the mm, science mm, of science. nature. So in yeah. the mosquitoes yeah, yeah. and the poisoning of the water. Mm. Um, and then I even learned that, which was quite fascinating at the time, how they cooked and how they moved camped, camps. Mm. And it says the British and the French and the Spanish came along and set fires and during the night, the smoke went up and they instantly became targets. What the Asians done, they used um, what we would now understand called it jerk. And they um, cured, cooked the meat on the ground. So it gave, gave off less smoke or no smoke at all. Yeah, very interesting. And <laughs> thank you, Brother Takish. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you very much. I mean, like, like, like I said earlier, voodoo, voodoo basically means using science and technology and so on to free a nation. That's what voodoo means, a free nation. Um, but it, it became, it became voodoo. Voodoo was then like, like a spiritual thing, you know, black ass or dark ass, as they say. But anyway, the next person is Brother Coco. <clears throat> thank you, comrades. Uh, thank you, Comrade Satish. Uh, very, very interesting, fascinating story. Fascinating history, let me say. Um, when parle queer piti piti, it's it's a a broken French in a way, but also a mixture of African languages, several African languages, and uh, French, mostly West Western African languages. So it's different from from Swahili. Swahili was in the East. They won't be anywhere closer together. Just to answer that question which you asked earlier, uh, Brother Kwame. Mm -hmm. So the question I have for you, Brother Satish, is we always hear about William Wilberforce and all the others as being the people who ended the slave trade. And we don't hear much about the, the play <clears throat> part Haiti played in uh, the slave trade ending. We are not being taught that. It's not just in Haiti that we are talking about, it's generally in Africa. We need to be talking about the balanced history. We need to be teaching our children the, the, the right history. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to persuade 
our African countries to, to teach the right history. Haiti's impact was momentous. They always say it was like an earthquake because after Haiti got mm. its, its independence, uh, every, everything started happening. You know, Jamaica was mobilized. Cuba, things happened, even in, in America itself. It's not something which they, they put in, in history here in the UK. They are trying to sell it as we deliver, how do you call them? We, we liberated the slaves. We, the British, liberated you people from slavery. And they don't want to talk about the British involvement in slave trade. So there, there has to be something, not just here in the UK, but in Africa itself. But the way things are, are happening in Africa, I don't know. I'm just trying to ask a question. How can we do that? The last question I have is, why did uh, Heidi agree to such a, uh, I mean, a, 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 a very bad deal with Napoleon? I know there were guns, they were uh, under siege. But why did, did, did they agree? And is there any way that we can ask for reparations for that? Thank you. Well, um, <coughs> there are a couple of questions there <laughs> which need answering. One of them, the solution is education. Haiti and its revolution should be part of this school curriculum everywhere in Africa. Now, I understand Comrade Pigeon is a teacher as well. Well, we need to start pressurizing the education responsibility, whoever is responsible for education in Africa, that enslavement did not end with people being seized in Africa and transported. <clears throat> that was simply the first part of the atrocity of enslavement and the transatlantic slave trade in particular. There is too little information available in Africa on the other part of it. Like I went to Ghana and uh, saw the, uh, the door of no return. And I started asking the people, do you know about Pétion? Do you know about uh, the role of Alexander Pétion in the struggle against uh, slavery? And it ended up that I was actually educating them when it was their job to educate me. <clears throat> uh, so I would suggest that every one of us who has any contacts within the education systems in Africa put pressure on those in charge to include Haiti and its revolution and its impact as part of the curriculum. Every single student Every single child in Africa needs to know about the Haitian Revolution and mm. its importance to Africa. The other question that you asked, uh, you may have noticed I slightly smiled at it. And the reason <clears throat> I smiled at it is it is one of history's great lies. You need to ask yourself certain questions. Britain abolished the slave trade in 1807, and it was portrayed as this great, great step of principle in the fight against slavery. What? Why is nobody asking? Why was it the slave trade that was abolished and not slavery? And why was it 1807 as opposed to 1790? or 1840? <clears throat> the answer is Haiti. The revolution happened partly because <clears throat> it demonstrated how problematic the slave trade was. And it was problematic because the regime was so brutal, you kept having to replace the stock of enslaved people. For example, slavery in the United States hmm. 
survived so long. Because... Uh, sorry, brother. Satish, um, make your answers now brief because of time. Yeah, okay. Uh, basically, uh, slavery <clears throat> survived so long in the United States because they bred slaves. Hmm. So these people did not have a recollection of what life was like before slavery. It was their life. They were born into it. That hmm. didn't happen in Haiti. So far from being this great, great positive step, it was actually the last desperate throw of the dice to retain the institution of slavery. Right, thank you. We've got um, a few more hands up, but the time is three minutes past nine. We don't usually go beyond our time. Mm -hmm. and as I said, uh, there will be two more sessions on Haiti, current analysis and future analysis. We shall let you all know. Uh, but I will ask the three hands uh, up to speak, but please make it very, very brief. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a minute or so, and then so that Brother Sachish can be a minute answer, and then we'll pick this up in the next session. I will ask him, brother, brother Pigeon, to show his face so I can let him okay. check. And oh, I, can't, I cannot see you, you are there, but I cannot see your face, sir. Um, the other thing also is um, there is a brother I'm reading, Joe Kuver Yao. Um, I've sent him a private message, but no response. Um, that name is the name of an uncle of mine. Uh, my mother's family. I'm wondering if he's part of my family. But I need him to um, contact me privately as I've sent him a private message. Brother Pigeon, over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me start with the uh, Angela, one minute, and then we go to Joseph, one minute, then uh, Arinomi, and then Michael. One minute, each, please. Hi, good evening. I would like to uh, you're not talking poor. In, few words, in a few, in a single word, what would you say is the future of Asian Revolution? I would like to ask, what is the future of Asian Revolution in Africa? Describe in one word. Probably that would be the next session on the future, but it is free to say what he thinks the future is, but you'll have a, a session on the future. But not that, okay. but the strategy, so that you can answer to these questions once. So let me take the second question from Brother Joseph. Brother Joseph? I'm, I'm mute. You, you are muting yourself. You are muting yourself. It's you, you are doing that. Muting and unmuting. OK, you'll work on that. Uh, Brother Coco, I'm seeing your question on reparation. What was it? Brother Joseph, you can proceed. So, Brother Coco, can you type your question on reparation on the chat? So, Brother Joseph, one minute. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, <clears throat> yes, I'm, I, I'm not, I, I am muted. <laughs> but you have unmuted yourself. That's why you are speaking and I, and I can hear you. Okay. Can you work on your microphone? Brother Renumi, one minute. I'll be back to you, Brother Joseph. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so that I won't waste much time. I think uh, what I just find missing here is that uh, I want to, I would have loved us to hear how exactly did African get to IT in the first place? Because I've been trying to reconnect. I know there is a story of a lost ship of uh, Christopher Columbus that was carrying some people in uh, 1492. And then the people, the people that got, uh, okay. that's how, Black people got to IT. We need to okay. link that. And then, then when he was making presentation, he made mention of the the bravery of the Haitian war uh, army or untrained army. I also think we should also be conscious of the fact that uh, Ethiopian army too were brave, were brave enough to have defeated the Italian army in the 1896. And then to wrap it up, the education. African education curriculum we are talking about does not exist here. Even here, with those of us that are claiming to be in uh, independent countries like Nigeria and other places, our the history was was taken out of our educational curriculum. The, okay. the history that will inspire us. So one of our action on this forum should be how we can actually now look at how we can. Okay. I, 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 African world history, how we can put it together and now start pushing it across to ourselves in both Africans at home and Africans in the elsewhere. Since we have more okay. session in the future, maybe we can look forward to that. 
Yeah, thank, thank you for that. Thank you for that. We are thinking that line already. We are thinking on how to come up with the what you call a Pan African cause that in touch on the philosophy, economics, politics, and history. I think we talked to the brother Satish on this, and we will see how we can craft that. But also, also we are looking for Pan African education curriculum as well. That's uh, what we've been working on. But I think we can propel this further, brother Joseph. Brother Joseph, your 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 hand, you are you have unmute. Okay. You're still doing the same thing. Muting. Yeah, okay, right. Are you hearing me? Sorry, I was I don't know what happened. Are you hearing me? Yes, kindly proceed very fast in a minute, please. Yeah, quickly. Um certainly I agree with Brother Shatish that we must put the Haiti at the forefront of our consciousness. And all Africans, you know, I always say I feel African first, Haitian second, and Grenadian third. Um but a question, a quick question to, to him in relation to the role Haiti played in uh, the Grand Colombia uh, experiment when uh, Bol Simon Bolivia went to Haiti and uh, got some supply from him. There's a house in Jack Mel in Haiti right now that still that hold, that serves as a sort of monu um, uh, a memorial for that visit that uh, Simon played, Simon Bolivia Bolivia played to Haiti. Can you respond to that quickly? Okay, not that. I'm taking the last question, Brother um, Satish. So you're getting in as you wrap up your answers and you wrap up your summary to this session. Mm -hmm. uh, Brother Michael, just one. Yes, yes just one question. Um, my question is, why do I feel that Haiti is even isolated amongst the Caribbean islands? They always seem to be on their own. No one, I, in my you know, brief knowledge of, you know, the, the, with Haiti, they always seem to be on their own. It's almost like no one wants to come and stand up from none of the other Caribbean islands. It's almost like okay. an act of cowardice or fear to be associated with Haiti. Okay, thank you. So, Brother Satish, can you respond to these questions and give us your final remark? Um, <clears throat> okay, let me start with uh, the question on uh, Bolivar. It isn't once that Bolivar came to Haiti begging for help from uh, Alexander Pétion. It was twice. He came in 1815 begging for help. He got that help, and he then got shipwrecked and lost the lot. That is men, ships, and money. He came back suicidal in 1816, and Pétion gave him that help again. And he asked one thing and one thing alone in return. That is... Everywhere he went, he must abolish slavery. Bolivar didn't really do that. He claims <clears throat> that uh, he encountered a strange phenomenon, which is the slaves he was trying to liberate ran away from him back to slavery. Whether you believe that or not is another matter, but the fact of the matter is even Bolivar says the real liberator is Alexander Petion. Okay, the next few questions remaining, can you respond to them as fast as yeah. possible? Uh, uh, the well, reparations. Well, let's, let's end this. <laughs> I'm sorry, the indemnity. Ten past nine. Yeah. I'm sorry? Sorry, hold on, Satish. But I I'm of the view that we end um, this today um, because of the time, it's not 11 past nine. Okay, and then Brother Satish, in a minute, just give you a summary, but I think, as you've said, we will have the next session. So let's give us just your closing remark, Brother Satish. <clears throat> well, um, I'm going to suggest that people who didn't get their questions answered, write them in a chat, and uh, I can deal with it next time. <clears throat> but my closing remarks are, by now it should be obvious how important the Haitian Revolution is to me, but also to Africa. And the future must be education. People must understand how important this event is because you will understand the present and the future when you get to grips with the past. Haiti is the greatest example of all in liberation struggles. We must defend it. Thank you, thank you very much. Brother Akome, you can close the meeting. Um, uh, it's fine. 
you can definitely close the meeting and tell the meeting about. Um, okay, next, thank you next, very much. We, 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 okay, thank you very much. We appreciate your presence today. Uh, sorry, I was engaged somewhere else, but I'm back. And I hope it has been first for the time I've been here and even before. We will try to ensure that we actually have the IET session as soon as possible so that we connect the test to the end so that we finish it in a small series. So we'll discuss that and we'll get you notified based on all channels you've arrived at. But Brother Kwame, I will suggest if possible, you can share the link very quickly so people can get in touch with us via either our contact or our WhatsApp group because so many people are new so that they keep update on what's going on. But I will also reach out to you in any means you got here. So get in touch with us through any means you got in touch with us so that you join our every Saturday discussions and our Thursdays, we are welcoming you for our philosophical class, which we do every Thursday, 7 p.m. GMT. Kindly feel free to join us and learn with us. And next Saturday, we will communicate whether we'll have to go to part two straight or there's something else that will be coming up. So thank you for your time and thank you for your presence. I do appreciate you all. And may the revolution continue forward ever. Forward ever, backward never. Thank you all. Bye. Good night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Good you. Night. Fantastic meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent Thank you. meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Sachin. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah, Thank brother, you. you need to stop the recording. Yeah, I don't know if you well, stop. Yeah. You have the right to stop the recording from your side. Um right, let's see. Let's I see. think I was the one recording. I don't know if anybody else is. Yeah, it's okay. Let's see. Uh, oh, you were recording. It, um, <laughs> I, I can stop. I'm yeah. I want it stop. Hey, thank you. Yeah, good night, about brother Glenroy. Yes, you do do stop it. Thank uh, you. Just give I'm me a sec. To, <laughs> I'm trying to stop.